All right, everyone. So as I said, my name is Luis Soto. I'm a part of YIBT's team, and I have the honor today to be your moderator for this uh, bootcamp session, which is titled Innovate Innovative Value Proposition, the key to your startup's success with our guest speaker today, Alejandro Carbonell, who is the director of the Innovation Center at City of Knowledge Foundation. Um, first of all, I wanna remind everyone that this bootcamp session is taking place in the framework of TIC Americas. Now, what's TIC Americas? It's basically um, our tool that helps you achieve your entrepreneurial dreams. And it's a business accelerator um, that has helped more than 47,000 young entrepreneurs just like you and more than 48 countries reach their dreams. Um, this is our 16th edition, which we're very proud of. And we have three categories called um, the Eco Challenge 12, TIC Jalisco and Innovation Challenge. Um, if you're not yet um, familiar with those categories, we really encourage you to go to www.ticamericas.net, um, discover the categories, see which one is best for you and register your project. Um, just for registering, which is free, you get um, access to so many benefits, which includes um, the bootcamp sessions, which is where you are right now. Um, that's our tool to help you um, build your project into a one that is sustainable, that is solid, and that is concrete. Um, and they're completely free, and you get direct access um, to every single one of them once you register. So, go um, you know where to go right after this, right after this session, www.ticamericas.net. Without further ado, let me introduce you guys to Alejandro Carbonell, our guest speaker today. He is the director of the Innovation Center at City of Knowledge Foundation. He has a trajectory of more than 10 years working in different aspects of business in different um, companies in Latin America. And also he's very passionate about helping um, young entrepreneurs like yourselves reach their dreams and actually um, achieving their goals in their projects. So really take advantage of this, um, of this webinar, guys. Um, aside from being uh, the director of the Innovation Center, he's also the co-founder of Tutores, an online platform that connects students with tutors in Panama, Colombia, Guatemala, Dominican Republic, Peru, Chile, and Argentina. He has been a project development manager, a brand manager, and a product manager in different companies um, throughout his career. He has also has a master in business administration from EADA Business School, and he graduated in industrial engineering from the Technological University of Panama. He is certified by the Inter-American Development Bank in Big Data. And of course, he is an expert in today's topic, innovation and go-to-market strategy. Um, how to add that innovation um, part to your, to your project to really make it stand out. And as I said, he is an international mentor and speaker who is really passionate about helping you guys. So again, I wanna remind everyone that this is an interactive webinar. So if you have a question, feel free to drop it in the chat and I'll gladly read it to Alejandro and he can answer your question or you can just um, raise your hand in the participants button and we'll open the microphone up for you. And we'll remind you that we do have a question and answer session when once the, the presentation is over. Um, last but not least, please follow us in our social media. That's at YABTS on Twitter, at YABTDC on Facebook. We're always available through email um, through ticamericas at yabt.net and visit our websites, www.yabt.net and www.ticamericas.net. I think that would be it for me right now. Um, Alejandro, the floor is yours and everyone, this is Alejandro Carbonell. Thank you, thank you very much, Luis. Um, very excited to be here, very happy to be here and to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is innovation. Let me just share my screen here, great. So yes, as you were saying, we're gonna talk about innovating in the value proposition. And just as a, an extra reminder of what you said, everyone remembered that it, this is a group interaction. It's a very interactive presentation. So you can write your questions and comments in the chat. And at the end of the session, we will answer them, hopefully all of the questions. So I am expecting a lot of questions, a lot of comments. If you do not agree with something, make sure to put it there because I love these discussions. Um, a little bit about me, uh, Luis already said all my CV. So this is my, my social network, Alejo Carbo in every single social network and three main things that uh, I would say are part of me are the entrepreneurship because I am a co-founder of a startup, tech startup and I'm already uh, 
launching my next tech startup, hopefully in the next couple of months. So entrepreneurship is a big part. I'm also innovation, uh, other because I'm a, the director of innovation for a technology park, but also I love like reading about innovation, learning about innovation and mentoring about innovation. And of course, purpose, because I not only do startups or tech startups, I also co-founded a movement about uh, for, for young people about creating social impact through projects. So I'm a professor of social impact projects as well for the past three years. So I think everything you do, you must do it with purpose. A little bit about what we do at the City of Knowledge and specifically at the Innovation Center, we support startups. We support uh, entrepreneurs such as yourself. Uh, this is a list of 13 startups that we have invested in the past five years. Bear in mind that I have been the director of innovation for the past one year, actually 364 days. Tomorrow, I will be one year in the city of knowledge as the director of innovation. But before that, I have, have been for the past six years, co-founder, and I was the CEO of Tutores, which is the one that is here. So I actually came to the city of knowledge, to the incubator and the accelerator as a startup. I received investment, we grew, and then five years later, I became the director of innovation. So I'm very excited to be here as well. <clears throat> so let's first get on the same page. Let's get on the same mindset. My perspective, according to my background, this is what I'm going to present. I specialize in startups and innovation. So what I'm about to explain is based on my experience with my startup and the ones I work with or mentor at the Innovation Center. My intention is here to expand your mindsets, expand the space that we are giving for, for new and innovative ideas. So this is a safe place so you can discuss. And if you, as I said before, if you don't agree with something, this is the moment, or if you have any questions. We, we, we because I'm also, we are all founders. We're all co-founders. Some of us CEOs, COOs, CMOs, whatever you may want to refer yourself. So what do we have in common? What do we do? What is our role as CEOs or founders of our companies? You could say that it's to make decisions about business strategies, make sure your vision of the company is followed, finances, human resources, operation. But most importantly, you have to make sure your value proposition is well-defined and achieved. You are the ones responsible of defining the value proposition. So what is a value proposition? The value proposition is the benefit or result that your client will have once they use your solution. So, and this is, this is something that we have to make very clear. Sometimes people, they mi mistakenly say that their solution is the value proposition, but let's, let's make a, a, a quick example here. A solution could be that I am an online platform that offers job opportunities. That's what, that's what I do. But my value proposition is actually that I can find your dream job in 45 days. So the value proposition is the promise we make to our clients about the results they can get, while the solutions describe how we will get to those results. So the value proposition focuses on the result, not on the solution. And the value proposition is the what, while the solution is the how. But very important is that the value proposition is a hypothesis. It is an assumption that we make, that we think that the client wants or needs. And this has to be validated. And it can be, it can be different from what you originally thought because at the beginning you start with believing or having a, a hypothesis that maybe your client wants this Maybe your client needs this, and then your job is to validate this. And as I always say to all the entrepreneurs that I mentor or that I coach, never become attached with the solution. Get attached with the problem you want to solve. You must be willing to adapt your value proposition through the various interactions of your startups. And we'll see later some examples of that, how people, how companies and startups evolve and their value proposition evolved as well. So the value proposition answers the questions such as, who is the customer? What are the customer's pain points? 
What results does the customer get from using the solution that I'm offering? What sets you apart from your competition? And very important, it is written in your client's language. One mistake that I see is that founders usually start by defining their value proposition, thinking on their companies. What do they do and what makes them different? And I want to, I want to challenge this. In my experience, and I have seen many, many different startups and read also about different startups, and the best value proposition starts thinking on the client, not on what the company does. So it's, it's not only written in the client's language, so how I feel as a client, but also what they will get, what the client will get using your solutions or the value they perceive or get using your solutions. So how to define your startup's value proposition? Let's give us a quick example using a very well-known character. So as I said, people don't buy products, they buy better versions for, of themselves. So imagine that this, lead, I guess you played, I don't know how old are you, but I used to play with this kind of Mario. Uh, it's like 8-bit Mario. So Mario here, small Mario is, person who is a potential uh, client for your startup. And then Big Mario is the vision your client has of themselves after using your product or service. And the flower is a solution your company sells. So your business is not making a product. Your business is making people become awesome and do incredible things. So the value proposition is not the solution, but the awesome things your clients will be able to do after using your products. And this is very important because it affects everything, including your marketing. When you're talking about what you do, you don't talk about what my products do. You talk about what people will or they will be after using our products. Our products are just a mean, our services are just a mean for what they will become. So think about, about this, about having, about how, how do you sell your value proposition being what your client will become afterwards because of your great product. So let me give you an example of one of the startups we have here at the City of Knowledge at the Innovation Center. Evo Talents, their solution is described as a web platform that optimizes the search and hiring of artistic talent. So it's a, it's a platform, it's a marketplace, great but their value proposition. Evo Talent makes life easier for casting and advertising agencies, production companies, brands, and end customers by generating a diverse selection of profiles in record time. Your casting process in 30 minutes. This last sentence is actually the summary of everything else. Because if I am an advertising agency, if I am a production company, if I am a brand and I read this, your casting process in 30 minutes, I understand everything. It makes me feel better. It makes me feel more productive, faster, better because I'm using your product. And a very well-known uh, product, which is Uber, we all know what Uber does or what Uber is, but I like this, this is in their, in their website. So the, the small tagline, these are the value propositions that they offer is the easiest way around anywhere, anytime, low cost to luxury. And then they explain how do they do it. Okay, easy, easiest way around. One tap on a car comes directly to you. Hop in, your driver knows exactly where to go and when you get there. You step out, payment is completely seamless. So it, it is by itself, the value proposition, a great marketing tool because it makes people that are reading this feel that they will become better because they're using your product. They're, it's, you can get anywhere, anytime. You, it's the easiest way around. Oh, of course I wanna use Uber. So how do we make this in our startups, in our small companies or big companies? Because you can do this whenever you, you are in the, wherever you are in the, in the stage of your company because you have to reinvent yourself, uh, yourselves many times. And now that we are in, in, in a global crisis, we many, many companies are, are reinventing themselves. So I, I guess you already know this, but I'm still going to give a big overview of the value proposition canvas. 
I really like this canvas because it, it is like the connection between what the client needs, wants, or suffers, and what you are giving them. So let's, let's uh, and another very important thing is that you start always from your customer, from your client. So it's divided in three parts. The first one is the customer jobs. You need to answer your customer jobs, which is what's the customers trying to achieve or solve? So these are the customer jobs. It could be functional tasks, social, for example, uh, status, or what's in it for me. It could be emotional, like how do I uh, feel? It could be feeling good, better, quality of life. Then you have the pains, which, which is what happens when they can't solve it, when this that they need to, to do cannot be solved. So these pains are, it can be, it can be the pains during or after, after these jobs, and usually are the results of what they already use or the obstacles that they have or the risks, for example, the risk of rejection. And then you also have up here the gains, which are what would happen if they could solve it. So basically the gains are what they will receive. What are the benefits, expected benefits, desired benefits, or even unexpected benefits. So once you fill this part of the value proposition, then you go to this side and say, okay, how am I solving the pains of the client? How does the solution solve the main points of the customer? So this is basically an answer of this. And then you, you say, you ask yourself, how does a solution goes above and beyond to create benefit for the customer? So how do I give the client the gains they're expecting? And then after everything is complete, then you say, okay, this is the product or service I need to, uh, to relieve their pains and to give them gains. And this is basically uh, as well, it helps you a lot of with your, with your pitch because at the end of the day, your, your pitch is basically if you are doing this and this and that and you're suffering and this and you really want this, this is what we have that can solve you this and give you this. So at the end of the day, it's, it helps you with everything, with actually understanding the client, but, but also building uh, your marketing campaigns and all that. I'm gonna get, go very fast on this one. This is a, an example of my startup. Uh, so the customer jobs are, are that, for example, clients, which are the parents, not the students, as you may think, uh, they have to make online reservations, find a tutor according to their specific needs. They have to pay as well. Those are the things that they usually have to do when they are looking for tutors. And the pains are that uh, not knowing how to explain to their children. So, so this is a, a real problem for them. I don't have time to make homework with my children. I come home very late, I, I cannot study with them. So what do I want? What are the gains that I want? Are quality time with my family, receive a professional service and for their um, a professional service for their children to learn and pass their exams. So yeah, for their children to learn and pass their exams, I'm sorry. So this is, the, this is what they want. So what can we offer? Okay, to solve their pains, we have many options of tutors here, of tutors that can explain to my children. So there's a variety for them. And you can find a tutor at any moment on demand. So, okay, great, this, this can solve my pains. So what about my gains? What about what I want above and beyond? Okay, so we have available tutors that can solve the academic needs of my children and quality standards through selection filters, ratings, and public comments from other clients. Once I know I have that, I can be in peace with myself, in peace with my family, I will have quality time, I will receive a professional service, and I'm sure that my children will learn and pass their exams. Oh, by the way, everything is done because this is a product we have. We connect parents with the ideal tutor for their children. This is what we, this is a how everything is done. Great. So how to scale the value proposition of our startup. We can do this by innovating in the way we deliver the value proposition to our clients. So we start with something with a value proposition and then we need to iterate and innovate this value proposition. And how we do this? By creating a business model that is capable of delivering value to many. So the business model is the logic of how a company creates 
delivers and captures values for themselves and for their clients. Everything related to designing and manufacturing the product, selling the product, finding the right customer to distributing the product, everything related to how the customer will pay and how the company will make money, this is what the business model is all about. And there are many, many tools we can use. Uh, there's the business model canvas, and then there's the lean canvas, which I really like. Uh, it's a great way for your business model uh, through the, the, the lean canvas. Uh, I prefer this because it has a value proposition in the middle and it talks about the problem. So, but the business model canvas also works. I don't know if you've seen this, I'm sure you do. Just a quick reminder, it's a nine part canvas, uh, nine divisions. And it has everything starting from who are you selling? Who are your, your customer segments? All the way to the problem that you're solving, that unique value proposition, what's your advantage? And down there you have the revenue stream. So how do you, how will you get the money and your cost structure? How, how much would it cost and, and where is my, my cost uh, and my expenses going? And just a reminder as well, it has a reason to be the, the right side is all about the desirability. So who wants my product? The left side is about the feasibility. So can, can I do it? Is it, is, is it feasible for me to do it? And then the viability is about the revenues and the cost structure. So I need to think about, okay, this is my, these are my costs and are my revenues going to be enough? Is it very, is it easy for me to get revenue enough to cover my expenses, to cover my costs? So it's very important for you to not only fill this, uh, fill in the blanks of the, of the lean canvas, but do it uh, not only once, not only when you start a startup, because things change. In the last six years, my company, the Tutores has changed a lot. In the beginning, we were focusing on, on, on students, for example, and then we realized that no, our hypothesis was not correct. Our clients were the parents. We needed to focus everything, the marketing, the channels on our parents because they're the ones that are buying. That of course, we need to have something for, for the students because they're the end users, but we, we, need to, we need to focus on them. And we also have other clients, for example, our tutors. So what do we offer for our tutors? We need to have a, a lean canvas for them because at the end of the day, they are the ones that uh, give the service to the, the clients and to the end users. So let's give you, let's see uh, an example, uh, Zumba. I don't know if you guys uh, know Zumba. Let's talk about the evolution of Zumba. Zumba, Zumba Fitness, how it's known. And today, may, many of you may, may have heard it. Uh, maybe you say, okay, that's like a kind of a dance or it's an exercise. Well, it's a combination of both. Basically, what they do is you can exercise aerobically with aerobics, dancing by dancing, but specific dances. It's not like electronic music necessarily. Actually, it started with salsa and merengue kind of stuff, very, very Latino, but it burns calories and people love it because it's very fun. It's a fun way to exercise. So that's how it started. Let me tell you the story of Zumba. So this guy, Alberto Perez, Colombian guy, he started uh, giving classes of Zumba, actually giving classes of uh, aerobics, nothing special in his, in his gym. And then one day he forgot his mixtape back in 1998, we used mixtapes or CDs. He forgot his CD of the class, the music of the class. And then what he had in his bag were the CDs of merengue and you know very different kind of movement, but still movement. And he decided to give the class with that. And everyone was excited because everyone was like, okay, this is something new. I'm really having fun. And then he decided to make it a thing. So it was like a uh, Roomba size. It was Roomba in Spanish is like, uh, like a party. Like I go, to, I go to Roomba and size of exercise. So with the, the Roomba size, it was very, it, people, people really love it. And then one day in 2001, he met his friend also called Alberto, Alberto Perlman. And th this guy Alberto is like very open-minded. He said like, okay, hey, Alberto, this is a great business. It's a fun way to exercise, but we need to take this to the next level. 
I can help you. So Alberto Perlman, the other Alberto said, let's record you and sell the DVD so people can work out from their own home. And uh, the first Alberto was like, okay, this is great. We are changing our business model. It's not only one class that I teach to my students. Now it's a class that I can teach to many students. And it exploded. Everyone loved it. That was the beginning of 2000. That was like the Zumba Armageddon. Like people really loved it. But then time started to change and people said, okay, I like working out from home, but I prefer working out with, in my gym with my instructor. Why can't my instructor teach the Zumba classes? And then these guys, the Albertos said, great, let's teach these people, these instructors, these trainers, uh, how to make Zumba classes fun and how to follow our, our whatever we, we have built. So they decided to create certifications, that's ZIN, which is the Zumba Instructor Network. So basically what they did is they certified everyone that wanted to teach Zumba classes so they could use the name. They charged $300 for this. And then uh, they also charged them $30 a month so they can get extra content. Uh, and now it, the value proposition changed a little bit, not only for the end users that were having the exercise and having fun with that, but to the trainers. It was, it was a way for them to make money with something that they liked and that they were good at and that was good for, the, for everyone, making, uh, making exercises and dancing. So this changed completely the business model. It was not only a one-time fee of a DVD, it was a one-time fee of $300 and then every single month, $30 so they can make their own money. So this expanded everything. So in 2012, uh, they already had 100,000 trainers in the Sumba network and they were in already 125 different countries. Now in the, in the last couple of years, they already reached, I guess, every country in the world because in the website said they are in already 180 countries. I don't know how many countries there are in the world, but I'm sure they are in almost every single country. And weekly, they do 15 million, parti 15 million participants, they uh, do Zumba classes. So incredible. And then what happened? Pandemic crisis hit. So they had to pivot their usual classes because their clients, the trainers and their end users were not able to exercise anymore as they did before. So as a trainer, why would I keep on paying if I am not receiving classes? So what they do, what they did was pivot this and they created uh, virtual classes in their, in their website. If you go to Zumba.fitness, you get live streaming of trainers all over the world. So you can say, hey, you know what? I want to exercise with this uh, class in Zimbabwe, or I want to exercise with this class in Puerto Rico. You know, you can, you can find the, the different trainers and live stream, uh, uh, go into a different class and specific classes and pay for, for free or give donations. You can pay $5, $3, $9, depending on the class and then the trainer. And they even have on-demand classes. So trainers that are like very, very good, they record their classes and then students from all over the world can, can go and take their classes. Uh, so yeah, so what they did is they started pivoting their idea and their value proposition towards their instructors because they realized that they already had this brand, this big product, and the instructors were so passionate about, about the brand that they became ambassadors and why not? Let's, let's make them also partners. Let's make them get value from us. Let's make them uh, get money. And they are still being a brand ambassadors of our brand. So, so this is a very cool example of, of, of what they did and how they changed their model from a class with one instructor to a network of thousands of instructors in, in a time frame of 20, 21 years, 22 years. So it's incredible because sometimes you think like, hey, I already have my, my lean canvas. So I did it three years ago when I started my startup. I'm very, I have it very clear, but, but people change, uh, context change, you change, 
And as I said at the beginning, the value proposition is a hypothesis you have and generation change. And you should be able to change as well your business model, change your value proposition if your clients are changing or, 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 not, or not necessarily changing it, but at least making sure you understand that if, if your value proposition has to be, you know, pivot a little bit or um, brushed a little bit to make it more uh, specific for your clients. I, I, would, I would say my value proposition, my lean canvas in my particular company to Torres has changed a lot through the years. So the technology, the product or service by itself does not create the value. The business model is what creates the value. So your product and service creates a business strategy, which defines a business model, which then creates a value. So, at, and as I said at the beginning, it's not about how my product is bringing value to people, it's how, I, how, how everything in my, in my business model makes sense and gives value to my, to my customer, to my clients. So, and, and this, and as I give in the example of, of Zumba, you can have a limited business and this allows any type of business, limited business. For example, you would say, hey, a gym or a class, something that is very limited to 14 people that, were, that, that, that fit inside this class to scalable experience. They can, anyone can become a scalable experience, can become a startup. Once you understand that you need to add value, create value in the value proposition through your business model, through your business strategy. So once again, the business model is the one that creates value for your client. And our North Star or whatever we have to follow and whatever we have to do, no matter what, is to observe and talk to, to your customers, to your clients, understand what are their pains, understand what are their needs, and then decide how you are going to solve their pains, give them their gains, and then out of that, create your product. And remember that it is a hypothesis and it's your job to validate it. And when I say validate, I don't mean to make it correct necessarily, but it should also validate means you should also try to uh, see if it's incorrect, okay? So, so hey, this is my hypothesis, the value proposition I believe it has, but now that I'm talking to my customers, I realize that it is not, and it's okay. So I think it was a little bit under 30 minutes. So I wanna take this uh, time for your questions. Uh, any questions that you have, if you wanna raise your hand, uh, Luis can give you the, the mic or you can also write your questions. And I hope you, you like it. And if you didn't, that's okay because I want the discussion to happen. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, um, Alejandro. As, as Alejandro said, remember, um, this is now the question and answer uh, part of the of the session, you can drop them in the chat or just um, raise your hand. Right now, I think I have one question here from uh, Junior Mejia from Brazil. He asks, I think I haven't fully identified my value proposition. What you have mentioned does help me, but I'd like to learn more about it and really define my value proposition. Do you have any recommendations on courses, videos, blogs I can take, watch or follow that may help me define or create a strong and concrete value proposition? Greetings from Brazil. Great, great question. I would say there's plenty of stuff out there. Out there. Um, personally, what I always say is if you want to learn from what others have done, like the successful startups out there, just see what they're doing, listen to them, read from them. I really like a, a podcast called uh, Masters of Scale by Reid Hoffman, the, the, the founder of LinkedIn. He interviews, I, I don't know if you guys like podcasts as I do, but I really like podcasts. And this guy interviews everyone from, you know, Mark Zuckerberg to whatever person is creating a startup. So listen to them, listen to how they, they discover this value proposition, listen to how they pivot their business models. Because sometimes we, we think, because we see these successful startups that they have everything figured out. And it's not like that, it's, it is a big process. And the, what I really like about your comment is that you acknowledge that perhaps you don't, you don't know what is your value proposition and it is, it is perfectly fine. And it's much better for someone to say, 
I think I don't know than all these startups and all these entrepreneurs that I see that say, of course I know, this is my value proposition. And then when, when you talk to, you, to their customers, then they realize that it's totally opposite or it's not what they're thinking. So my, my recommendation other than listening and reading to these experts and specifically masters of scale, which I, which I really like, is to talk to your customer, interview them, ask them, hey, what, what, are you, what do you like the most? What do you hate the most about your, your day with your, with your children? You know, talk to them and, and really empathize with them. This is my, my recommendation. And then you will start answering the questions of what are the pains, what are the gains, and how can, can you help them accomplish uh, the, the big Mario, you know, the, the better person of, for, for them. Thank you, Alejandro. I actually had uh, a question. I actually had one question. I don't know if you could answer. Um, what if I, what if I have um, an innovative value proposition or an innovative um, business model, and you know, I put it, I put it on, on on course, and then how do I make sure it stays unique to my project, and that other companies, maybe bigger companies with more money, um, you know, they see that I'm being successful and they, you know, they adapt. Just to what I'm doing, which how, how do I make it unique and, and innovative for my project? So that's I, I don't really have the answer for that, but I can give you my my take on that and what I believe. There are seven billion people in the world, so I'm sure people around the world, in China, and Singapore, and Canada, and Greenland are thinking are having the same problems that you have are are thinking about the solutions that that you that you're thinking. So to make something unique, like it's the only thing in the world, it's very, very difficult, but it is possible because it is a combination of not only the idea and the solution, but also on how you deliver the value. Of course, if you're trying to create something really, really good about productions and, uh, and you know, TV or, 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 or for example, I don't know, movies, of course, Netflix and HBO will come and say, I have $1 billion and I'm going to make exactly what Luis is doing and I'm going to copy it. But as you may know, and you have seen in examples all over the world, this is not how things work. Not necessarily the biggest pocket will always win because you have, a, and I, would, I don't know how to express this, because, which is what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling, you have like a, a unique, not a unique, offer or solution, but a, a unique combination of things that make you unique. And you have to be open and have an open mind to identify these unique uh, capabilities, skills. I don't know if it's sometimes uh, serendipity that happens that makes you unique and valuable. And if someone can come and copy you, someone will come and copy you. And it is your job to iterate to pivot and to create something better. And yeah, that, I would say, don't be afraid. And I know it's not your specific example, it's a, it's a big example, but what I would say is never be afraid of not doing it because someone else with bigger pockets and more money can, can do it. No, you all have this unique set of things that make you unique. Thank you, Alejandro, thank you so much. Um, JR has another question, he, he asked, do you have any reflection about considering quality as value prop proposition? We had this conversation yesterday with, with Christina because specifically she was saying, because in, I, I would be so, super clear, in Panama usually having like a good customer service or quality service, it's something different. And we were saying people sometimes say their value proposition is we have quality service or quality food. But unless it's like above and beyond, I don't think this can be your unique value proposition because someone else can come and say, you know, I also have something of, of quality. And what is quality? Quality is, it's not a, a quantitative thing that you can say it is a measure of 10 out of 10. Quality is perception. You perceive that this is a, a quality product, a quality service. So it, it can be part of your value proposition, but you have to, I don't know, express it a little bit better 
so that the customer and the client feels and understands that actually it is quality. Um, I don't know if you've heard or seen this tagline of uh, safest, fastest way. Safest and fastest way, can, everyone uses this. In Panama, for example, every startup, every one out of three startups come with the safest and fastest way to whatever. The best quality of whatever. So it, it tends to be repetitive and that's why people start to see it as a, not as a, as a, as a as something extra, something valuable, but as a, as a basic, as a standard. So I'm expecting quality and I'm wanting or needing something else. So just, it is okay to have it, but be sure to add more value than just uh, quality because people expect quality from, from you. Thank you, Alejandro. Um, I actually had one more question and then we can, I think we can close with that. You know, um, something that I was wondering when you use the, you, the Uber um, example that their, their, their business model and their innovative um, value proposition, you know, is so solid and so good that they can actually use it as a marketing strategy. Um, should that be the goal of, of, of my value proposition that it's so solid that I can actually use it? You no, know, it sells itself, you know? Um, should that be the goal or, or is there, are there any other, you know, uh, standards that I can use to measure my innovative um, value proposition? Hmm, that's a good question. I don't know if it will be the goal of your company to, to use the value proposition as your marketing, um, but it really adds a lot of punch, I would say, because I've also, I also come from, from marketing background, a lot of punch to your marketing if it's, centered on the value it offers more than the solution it it offers and if you if you right now think about brands some brands are not using the solution like like it helps for your thirst no they use it gives you happiness you know coca-cola so it kind of i don't know if i'm kind of pushing it by giving you happiness but Still, that's what they believe is their value proposition. And so, so I think it gives the, the, your marketing, uh, and, and I will be very careful about using it as your marketing uh, strategy because marketing use uh, changes through time depending on the context. So you don't want your value proposition to be left as, a, as something from, from the past. So it can be part of your marketing, I would say. And if you make it, to be part of your marketing will be great. I, I remember when I just started my startup, uh, my, my mentors and everyone was telling me, hey, in the, in the platform, you should use your value proposition as your tagline. And I was like, but people will not understand what my product does. So it is, it is like a balance. So at the beginning, you cannot, you cannot put like, for example, in, in Uber, you cannot put like the fastest way to move if you don't know what Uber is, if you don't know that it's an actual platform. So you, you need to work your startup until you get to the point where your value proposition sells your company. But it has always, it needs to always be like implicit in the, in the message. Thank you, Alejandro. Um, I, we have one last question here in the chat, which I will read from Alberto. Hi everyone, Alejandro, how often should I change or recreate my value proposition? I think value proposition expires due to other competitors, changes in customer's habits, et cetera. How do you think about it? Sorry that I joined this session a little bit late. No worries, Alberto. I, I completely agree with, with Alberto. I think as well that value proposition expires or change or needs to be changed due to external forces, competitors, uh, customer habits, generation habits. For example, at the beginning uh, of my startup, I still had not maybe not millennials, but like older centennials as my as my end users, and now the, the younger centennials as my users, they, they think completely different. And that's why you also need to change your, your value proposition. My, my first clients were like Gen, Gen X parents, and now I'm having my millennial clients as, my, as the parents. So the way, the, the way they perceive the value from you changes as well. So I don't know if there's like a specific period of time that you should revise your value proposition, but I think you should always be open and it's a great exercise to talk to your clients and see if your hypothesis has changed. 
in, in our case, specifically in, in, in Tutores, uh, every single year we do an end of year interview or uh, surveys to our clients, just asking a couple of things. And then if we see a pattern that is different or through the year, if we see the pattern has changed, then we go back to the, to the table and, and, and to the drawing table. And, and you know, re, redo the, the value proposition canvas, redo the business model canvas and see if things have changed. No? So I think the best thing and the best uh, advice for specifically this is to uh, make a habit to talk to your clients and, and to listen to your clients specifically. Thank you, Alejandro. And thank you to everyone who asked. Um, that's unfortunately all the time we have for the question and answer. Um, Alejandro, if you have any closing remarks or any closing words, you, you can go ahead and say that now and then we'll just close the session with that. Great, thank you very much, Luis. Yes, of course, uh, just uh, a reminder, I just said it, talk to your clients, listen to your clients more than talking. Uh, they are the ones that have the, the what, what you need to make in your, in your company, no? And don't get attached, don't get in love with your solution, but get in love with the, the problem that you're solving. And this is the problem that you're solving. It's the one that is not the one that is going to change. The solution is the one that you're changing. No? And, and also another comment about, about uh, Junior, JR Mejia is that ask people, you know, people ask me like, hey, how do I contact entrepreneurs or how do I learn about or get a mentor, send them a message, go to their LinkedIn, go to their Instagram, go to their Twitters, ask them, hey, do you have 15 minutes of your time so I can ask you some questions? I, I really like what you're doing. I, I get every single week people ask, asking me for, for that and I really enjoy it. And I, I'm sure most of entrepreneurs and startups like to give back. So, so don't be afraid of asking. Alejandro, I don't know if you can um, mention again your social media and your email, just in case. I don't know if you can drop it in the chat or just mention it real quick for, for everyone that joined a little bit late. Social media, it's, I'm going to put it in the chat, at Alejo Carbo in every single social network, uh, even the ones that I don't use, like TikTok. And my email, you can write me to Alejandro at tutores.com and I will definitely answer any questions you have, comments, whatever. Perfect, thank you. Well, thank you so much, Alejandro. Um, of course, everything that you said has so much value. We know how much, how important, you know, that innovation element can be um, to our value proposition and our business model. So I know that everyone who joined um, can really take advantage of that. And everyone who will watch um, a little later in the recording um, will also really take advantage of this. So Alejandro, again, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, once again, I want to remind everyone that this is in the framework of PIC Americas. Go to www.picamericas.net, find uh, the categories, discover them and register. We have so many benefits and good things for you guys that you can take advantage of. So um, once again, Alejandro, thank you so much. Guys, everyone, get involved. Don't stop. Don't give up. And, you know, we, we at YABT are here to help you. And there are entrepreneurs like Alejandro all over the world that we can connect you with who will also help you too. So thank you so much, everyone. Have a nice day. And Alejandro, thank you so much again. Thank you, Luis. Bye. Thank you. Bye.